Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about real estate. Joining me once again, as always, my co-host Jesse Barrientes. Jesse, how are you? I'm doing great, Dave. How about yourself? Very well. Good to see you. You too. Well, it is spring. People are putting their properties up for sale. Other people are looking to move into properties. They want to get this all done during this season so that when the, the school starts up again in the fall, their children are set. Is that basically what we're talking about. This is the season. That's it. The springtime is traditionally the season, although obviously you could buy or sell a house any other time, but that's where there's a big uptick and everything. The birds are chirping, grass is growing, and it's time to, you know, time to move on. Okay. Let's talk about the seller's perspective first. They need to get their property in a sellable position. What do you recommend in terms of that? Well, the first thing that uh, a potential seller should do is to uh, go to a, a real estate agent that has experience, not just with real estate, but especially in your particular area, because there are little clicks, little different things uh, that that you know people should know. And if they, if you get somebody who's familiar with that area, and, and they they have a better base of knowledge, so that would be the very first thing. And I would suggest certainly too that you would follow that person's advice. They're probably going to tell you the very first thing they're going to do is they're going to do like a market analysis where they will look at your property. They're going to look at the history of the sale of your property, uh, what it last sold for. They're going to look at other properties within about a you know one to two mile radius of your house, uh, looking at the square footage, looking at the similarities and everything else, and looking at the history of, of how those things sold or when they sold. So they can get kind of a, an idea of a price. And you want somebody locally who knows your area, who has the ability to show the house without any difficulty, and someone who's aggressive, correct? You want someone who's on top of it and is working diligently on your behalf. Right. Uh, I mean, certainly we could use the word aggressive on that, but yeah, you want somebody who's who's looking after your best interest, who wants to get the house sold. There's a lot of different reasons to sell a house. It could be uh, that your family is uh, is expanding and you need more space. It could be that your family, uh, you're empty nesters and you know you want something a little bit smaller, and so it's time to do that. It could be a tragedy like a divorce or a death or something uh, something of that nature and then it has to be it has to be liquidated there's a, a bunch of reasons okay. do you recommend making improvements before you sell it for example if you know the 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 painting and the carpeting is out of date if the appliances are are very old and dated do you recommend that that seller make the improvements so that it shines as opposed to as opposed to maybe giving a credit upon sale. Right. Well, it really depends. That's why I'm saying it's important to listen to the advice of, of your realtor because uh, if you could really update it for a minimal amount of money, great. And if, and, and if it's going to cost you a whole lot, you know, maybe not. Uh, carpet's a good idea. I mean, you know, could you clean it rather than replace it? Um, uh, you know, it's going to be people's first impression. Uh, I still think that it's a buyer's market out there because if the people have the money, they could buy whatever they want. But remember, Real estate is unique. There's nothing like this piece of real estate ever, any place in the world. And so if somebody sees a unique piece of real estate and that's the real estate they want, then that's what it is. Okay. I just think people want to move into something that doesn't need a lot of work either. Oh, I agree with you. If they can see that the kitchen's been updated right. and the, uh, the air conditioning's been replaced recently, little, little tips like that, little things that, that play in their mind where they realize, hey, we can just move in here. There's not a whole lot we need to do, right? And we can get on to living in this this wonderful house. So, but that makes the difference, though. I think in terms of your total uh, total selling price, right. if you have something that's new, presumably you'll be able to get uh, a higher price for it rather than something that still still works but is older. And then who knows? The, the people that are buying your house, uh, they may have experience and and you know looking for a deal. Uh, not necessarily talking about flippers, just somebody to. to come in and to buy the buy the house. Yeah. But I agree. I mean, for me, it'd be, hey, listen, I don't want to have to do any work. I just want to be able to move in and, and go from there. Yeah. We're going to get into the real estate contract in a, in a minute, but let's talk about the first contract, which is the actual listing agreement that you have. That's a contract. That's it a is. binding agreement. Yes, it is. And, and there's and a lot of litigation on that. There is, depending, because if people you switch <laughs> realtors, exactly Not right. only that, people drop the realtor and try and sell it to someone that was introduced through that realtor. Right. And now the realtor is due their commission. So there's a lot of uh, funny business that can go on with that. But I think in this market right now, things are selling relatively quickly, and you're going to get your sale. The realtor's going to get the commission. Uh, in, in years past, you'd, you'd go a whole 
uh, six month cycle and you might not sell the property, right. you'd have to re up it. Well, you but, could you but talk could, about that that contract. Are you going to negotiate the uh, the commission, or are you going to just kind of go with what they say? <laughs> it's a uh, you know it, it's it's a seller's well uh, a buyer's market, but in terms of making it some type of agreement and negotiating. You can negotiate anything. The important thing to know is that unless I ask you, I won't know. What's the worst thing that can happen to me? If I say, okay, uh, you're, you're wanting to charge me 6% and I say, hey, look, you know what? Um, how about uh, four and a half or 5%? What's the worst thing that you could tell me, Dave? Well, they could say no, but you, they could also say yes, and then you run the risk they're not going to work that hard because they don't have well, a lot of skin in the game. Well, not necessarily. They're going to start showing another property where they're getting a six percent commission. Well, not necessarily. Okay, you can negotiate that, and it depends. You know what? What does a really percent do? Well, okay, it depends on the price of your house. Now, for a house that's worth eighty thousand dollars a percent, right, or hundred thousand dollars, be what? Not a whole whole lot, right? One thousand. Now, if we're talking about a half a million dollar home. That makes a huge difference, and I still think that in that case, certainly the realer, uh, realtor is going to be uh, be diligent because it's still a tremendous amount of money. So you can still ask, but you know that's a good point that uh, if they do get it for less, they may not work as hard. But you really don't you know don't know what's going to happen. That's why you might want to just do a listing agreement for three months to see what happens. Okay, and is, then is there much in there. the way of expenses that the realtor has to incur? Because they're basically putting it on the uh, the MLS. It's right. going to be on the internet. They're not necessarily going to run separate ads and print periodicals like they used to. So really, there's not a big expense. It's just a time commitment, correct? Right, and it really depends on the specific realtor. Hey, people do what they know, and uh, there may be some residual expenses. I mean, we're going to get into other expenses that you're going to have as a result of selling your house in terms of inspections We'll go, when we yeah. go through the contract. Well, let's fast forward. Right. Good news is we've listed the property. We've got a buyer who's interested. They have a separate realtor. They or, proffered a contract to you, right? And you have to move quickly. What is the very first thing you need to do when you are given an offer to purchase your real estate as the seller? Right, you need to go through the contract and sign it. But before we get there, you just uh, reminded me of something. Um, they have what they call dual agency, which gets a little sticky. That means that the realtor represents both the seller and the buyer. Right. Goes both ways. It goes both ways. And, and that, uh, you know, that's kind of a trick bag sometimes because, okay, wait a minute. But they have to disclose that. And if you sign off on it, it's too bad for you. Uh, but you, you really want somebody kind of just, you know, working for you. But then there's an incentive because then if that person, the realtor, uh, if there's nobody else, they receive the total commission. Correct. So, uh, you know, so again, there's just. So instead of splitting five or six percent. Right. They can. Uh, earn the entire five or six percent, subject to whatever their agency takes as their commission or Ex exactly. franchise fee. Right. So the first thing that I do when uh, when a client is telling me that hey, listen, uh, you know they have it listed and they're expecting a, a contract, uh, they they received an offer. Okay. Well, they received the offer. Okay. Then they go through the contract. Well, presumably they've gone through it with their realtor. Now they have standard uh, real estate contracts. This one I think is a 5.0. I think we're up to like 6.1 now. And what they do, the Real Estate Association, they continue to update it as as things kind of change. They make improvements. They make improvements. So it's pretty nice. So it's been it's been growing. And so that also makes things standard throughout uh, wherever you're going in terms of what the contract is. And so the uh, sellers now uh, hey, if they're okay with the price, because sometimes they can get lowballed. If you're asking for uh, three hundred thousand dollars, that's what it's listed for, and somebody gave you an offer for two hundred, two hundred and fifty. Okay, well, obviously you don't have to take it. If price is a matter, it matters to you. Then that's what you want to look at. Okay, so you go back and forth, and your realtor is really going to be uh, instrumental in helping and facilitating that part of the deal. And so finally, if you get to a place where okay, hey. Uh, that's the right price, you're okay with it, okay? Then, as the seller or seller, sometimes obviously there's more than one person, then you sign off on the contract. And that starts a number of things ticking. That's the date of acceptance. So somebody's made an offer, and now you as the seller have accepted it. If I'm the attorney for the seller, I'm going to be waiting, and we'll go through the, these items here uh, in the contract, but I'm going to be waiting for a request from the 
buyer's attorney. Now, if you look at the contract, because they're standard, you have general stuff. Obviously, they list the parties, they list the property, they list uh, uh, the square footage. Then they list specific property, like refrigerators, uh, microwaves, dishwashers, satellite dish, uh, air conditioning. It, yeah. they I know wanna, They want to be clear on what's coming with right. the sale and what the seller can take with them. Right, and what's not coming. And there's a special line that something is specifically included or specifically not included. This can also be a problem. I've had situations where, okay, uh, maybe there's a refrigerator. And then at the time of the final walkthrough, oh, it changed. It's not the same refrigerator. Right. And uh, I've seen cases where they took the sump pump out. Right. And it was discovered on the walkthrough that there's no sump pump in there. So they had to either put it back or give it credit. Which is, which is crazy. Absolutely Why would it take crazy. the sump pump? Okay, replace your sump pump. But right. and, and besides, okay, what's where's the water going now? Right, uh, right. to get out of there. So that's to, you want to make sure you're very specific in what that stuff is. Uh, you know, one of the standard things would be the the remote controls for the garage door, uh, the garage door opener, that kind of thing. Um, and then of course we talked about the purchase price and then the earnest money. Okay, let's talk about earnest money because that's a often misunderstood concept where uh, it has to be increased at some point upon total acceptance when the contract is solid, uh, but talk about how a minimum earnest money deposit will actually start the contract. Well, uh, generally it says that uh, you, you put something down again. It depends upon the price of the property. Um, I've seen you know, $1,000 earnest money. I've seen $5,000. I've seen more than that. And your realtor is probably going to tell you, hey, listen, if you really like this house and uh, you have to show that the sellers that that you mean it, as you referred to a little earlier, you got some skin in the game here. And so the bigger the earnest money is, the more serious it shows that you are about the property. You're quite correct that sometimes uh, the earnest money gets increased to by maybe a few more thousand dollars upon acceptance that we were just talking about. So I'm making the offer, I'm given the earnest money, and then upon acceptance, I got to pay another amount. Um, generally, uh, what I've just seen is that hey, there's only one earnest money, and it's at the at the time of of acceptance. Once well, it's accepted, the standard contract contemplates sure. an increase by a certain date upon acceptance. Yep, it does, but a lot of times those provisions are stricken out, which is fine. You know, the, the bottom line is that, hey, the seller wants to sell it and hopefully the buyer wants to buy it. Um, then as you go through the contract, you've got different terms in there like your closing date. Uh, the realtor is just going to put a date in there that's probably going to be, oh, 60 or more days out uh, in terms of what it is. You have control over that because there's certain things and we're going to talk about what you need to do as the seller to be able to get everything together to sell it, and that's going to take you a, a little while to uh, to get that together. There's yeah. also it also depends if it's going to be a cash deal or if the buyer is going to need time to obtain financing. That's, that's going to increase the time frame to to get to a closing date. That's correct. They have a, a new they're called new triad regulations. They just changed the law. Um, uh, Let's talk about here. that. Explain to the viewers. Well, well, I'll tell you. No, I mean, and, and basically, from my perspective, it really doesn't mean I don't think a whole whole lot. From my point, it means a whole lot from the title company. There's no more closing uh, or settlement uh, HUD one. It, it's it's similar. There's obviously going to be a, a layout of all the expenses of everything else. But the deal is though that hey, look, the lender, uh, and this is really meant to protect people who are buying real estate. The lender has to have their documents and everything um, all uh, ducks in a row at least 10 days or a couple weeks before. And so from my perspective as a seller's attorney, I have to make sure that, that I order title as soon as possible so that the lender has a copy of that so they can finish their work up on time. Also, so that uh, uh, I have my figures into the title company so that it, you know we're ready to go within the time frame. So from my perspective, really, I don't think it's you know really too, too bad. It just means that, hey, look, you know what? I have to really stay on top of my game and just get things to you a little sooner. Lenders are aware of this and so lenders are are you know bear the brunt of of, of that so you mentioned something is replacing the HUD one right I mean right now the HUD one it's just as, and it's called a HUD one or settlement statement and yeah. they're not going to have a, a HUD one or settlement explain statement. to the viewer what that document was and how important it was in terms of disclosures well what it is is there's a seller side and a buyer side and every little thing on the transaction is listed and you have for example the purchase price what the uh, buyer is going to get in terms of a credit proration and we'll talk about that for for uh, for real estate taxes also any other types of uh, of proration 
education that that person might receive. Uh, obviously, they're going to get a credit for the earnest money that they have deposited. Or if there's a negotiated credit for uh, changing an item or uh, replacing something in the house, um, you know, you'll be able to see that, although it's not always on that. And then on the seller side, you're going to see, okay, here are the funds, you know, minus the mortgage that you have to pay off, minus the credits that the other side is getting. And then you see at the bottom, look, okay, how much you're going to net. And at the bottom of the buyers, it's going to say how much you need to bring. Now, even though they're going to do away with that, we're going to really have, obviously, we're going to have a, a similar... Yeah, there still has to uh, right. be full disclosure, right. transparency, that... That all has to continue, despite the fact there won't be a HUD-1. Right, but I mean, again, a rose by any other name is still a rose, right? So you're going to have that information because it's essential to know what it is. And so, yeah, realistically, that's how that's going to that's okay. go. Let's talk about some of the very important parts of the contract. Yep. Um, one of the ones that I find important uh, is possession. Um, you can actually close on a house and not be granted possession of that house. The seller might not be able to vacate by a certain date because they might be moving into another house. So how does that work in terms of possession, in terms of giving the buyer some credit? Well, generally, um, you get possession at the closing. But if it's a situation that you've just uh, indicated here, what can happen is that uh, possession could uh, be tendered maybe, oh, uh, a week, a month, couple, whenever, it's really up to the parties, after the closing. But this is what happens then. Usually, some of the funds are retained and held by the title company in escrow to make sure that when you leave, the house is in the same condition and there's no damage to it. Also, you're going to be expected to pay, and it's called a post-possession agreement, you're going to be expected to pay uh, for uh, some type of rent to take care of whatever the mortgage payment is. Use and occupancy, right? Right. And so, uh, of course, now understand that there's using of the, of the water, too, and, and all these other uh, utilities that are still going on. But that, that does happen um, quite often. Okay. Let's talk about these statutory disclosures. Ah. What is that all about? The disclosures, and we're going to look, and Dave, I, I know you're familiar with some of that stuff, too. You've got the Residential Real Property Disclosure Report that pretty much uh, goes through a list of things that, hey, you know, it says, look, uh, I've uh, either occupied or haven't occupied the property within the last 12-month period because there are a lot of uh, properties that are vacant, and uh, those are a little bit different. But, you know, if you're there, you should know the answer to those questions. It asks you whether or not um, the property or you're aware that the property is located in a floodplain or if there's any defects in the chimney uh, or the roof or the ceilings or anything like that, if you're aware of any defects in the electrical or if you're aware of any leakage or any flood problems yeah, in the property. I think that's a big one here. And th th The water in the property is one of the big ones. The sellers often won't disclose it right. because there's a big expense to improve it or to correct it, and they feel that the buyer might not realize it until you know, six months, a year down the road when there's a particular storm that leads to water. But really, this document says you have to disclose it. Otherwise, you can be held liable for damages, attorney's fees, and all the rest. That's correct. So as a seller, if you know your property has an issue with the foundation, it's much better to disclose it up front, or even better to fix it. That way you can, you know, show that it's been remedied, but you must disclose the existence of it if it's happened within the last, I believe, one year. But if you have corrected it before that time and you fix the problem, and it is fixed, you really don't have to disclose it after that period of time. I think the better course is to disclose it because then there's no question. You don't want people coming back, and I've done this in terms of litigation over that very issue, which is going to be uh, quite costly. So my preference is, hey, look, you know what? I mean, I remember a time... Uh, uh, Oh, I don't know, it was maybe a couple of years ago when we had all that water uh, everywhere, here in DuPage and other places, and, uh, and, and places that normally wouldn't uh, have flooded, flooded because some pumps failed or whatever. I mean, that's a little bit different. I would still disclose that, but it's not a, of a question of, okay, water came in through the crack, okay? It was, right. all right, the sump pump failed, okay. Uh, if you're a seller with a problem with water right. in your basement, you know it. Right. You and, sure and, do. And you best disclose it. Exactly. That's what are some of the other disclosures lot. besides the residential real property disclosure report? Well, you also have disclosure for uh, radon uh, hazards. Radon is a naturally occurring gas, um, and it really affects small children. I've had actually a, a couple of transactions recently, one where I represent a seller, and there was a, a radon issue. Um, 
and uh, one where I'm representing the buyer and there was a radon issue. So what happens is they do a test and everything has to be undisturbed for 48 hours. And then the technicians come back and they look at the results of the test. I believe uh, it's like a four is what's standard. So anything over that is on the higher side and it's going to require then radon mitigation. Um, it depends on the size of your house and the size of the problem, what it's going to cost to, to do that. But they come in and they install vents and maybe some uh, fans or whatever. And uh, it's, uh, you know, probably going to be, you know, 11, 1200 bucks ish. Uh, and that could go really, you know, uh, higher than that. Um, and then it has to be retested by a different company, because you don't want the same company who installed the radon, because the, the radon mitigation system, that's just to keep everybody honest, from them saying, oh, well, there's no more uh, radon here because, uh, you know, uh, of the, the work we do. Now, for a seller, this is the important thing. If the seller, the seller can do a couple things. The seller can, can fix it or can give a credit and let the let purchaser, the let it. the buyer do it. However, here's the problem. If the deal falls apart, then the seller is still going to have to install it and fix it anyway because they have to disclose it because now they have knowledge of it. And when people hear those things, radon, oh, you know, I mean, there's a, it's a buzzword for them. Right. So, and you also get a disclosure, a uh, little pamphlet that tells you, um, you know, what, uh, uh, what radon is and, and all that other kind of stuff. Okay. Let's talk about a more common one that most people know, and that's the mold disclosure. Yep. Talk about that if you would. The mold disclosure, if you have any... Uh, uh, knowledge of any mold. Uh, you have to let them know and then you do the same thing. You have mold remediation. That could be quite costly. Let me tell you what some of the problem is with that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the older houses too, when you have the vents from the bathroom, it's supposed to be vented all the way out of your house. And many go just into the attic. Many go just into the attic. And what happens when you're in the shower? You have all the steam and Mildew. all that moist water, exactly. And that's where it goes. And that's when you're, you know, you're gonna have a problem. So, uh, but, and we're yeah. gonna talk about how we find these things out when we go back to the contract. Yeah, it's amazing to me how they thought venting it into the attic was uh, good enough. Well, they thought, the as, they thought asbestos was good enough to use That's insulation true. for everything, too. So, That's true. so there you go. So you have that. And then the last disclosure, uh, which I believe I dropped uh, on the floor here, but uh, it is, thank you, it's the paint, the lead paint. Yes. And it's before 1975. Um, and again, if you have, uh, it's very, very important uh, because... Uh, especially small kids, you know, you know, kids put all they kinds put of in things their in their mouth and you don't want to do anything to, to injure a child or have any kind of part in that. And so if you know about it, you got to tell them. And like I said, that's only stuff built, uh, you know, uh, before 1970. Yeah. And, okay. and so when you have that, okay. Um, so you have new construction, there's still a lot of old buildings. And so those are the disclosures that you need to make. Um, the reason why uh, we were talking before about the trigger, once the seller accepts the contract and actually signs off on it, that triggers a couple of, uh, couple of things. Um, that triggers the attorney's review, which uh, an attorney can review the contract and uh, can declare it null or void, can request modifications. Uh, to anything except the purchase price. Anything except the purchase price. And that can be, uh, or that's within five business days from the date of acceptance. So let's just say it's a Sunday when uh, you sign the contract. And uh, so five business days would be the following Friday. Right. And so uh, you've got a lot of things as a buyer to be able to do. The buyer now, because there's also a professional inspections provision that, uh, th that goes along with the attorney's review. And so you have to get your inspector out there and the inspector is gonna go through the house and kind of give you uh, a detailed, although not as detailed as it could be, uh, history of look what needs to happen, or maybe some wiring it's it's not wired correctly, or or perhaps uh, um, you know you need uh, special outlets, or maybe there's a crack here, or maybe um, the the circuit breakers aren't appropriate ampage, or, or or those kinds of things. Right, there could be a dangerous condition. There on could the be property, a dangerous condition. But you should have that inspector in your back pocket before you actually sign the contract, so you're ready to go with all these things. Right, and, a and lot if of you don't have one, your realtor can probably recommend someone right. that they've used, like and trust. Exactly, and. Uh, uh, that's important. I tell people, you know, when I'm representing the buyers that, hey, listen, you, you need to take care of this immediately because I only have that five business days in order to look at everything. Plus, you're going to have your radon test done. 
Plus, you're going to have a, a wood destroying insect inspection, you know, termites. Hey, you know what? You're making a huge investment. So these few hundred dollars that you're going to spend on these things are essential. It's important. So that you have a good idea going into the deal what you might need to do. Now, once you do that, the uh, buyer's attorney is most likely going to send a letter to the seller's attorney that says, hey, look, here's a copy of the pages of the inspection report where it says that we need uh, GCFI breakers or uh, we need uh, um, these, these outlets are wired improperly or, hey, look, uh, there should be a, a two-foot lift on the, on the stoop coming off the house and, and that's sunk due to settling and, you know, various things. Uh, and, and, and simple things like appliances not working properly. Right, appliances, you know. And not venting properly. Exactly correct. Um, and the contract basically says, hey, look, in the inspection provision, that if the, if the device functions the way it's supposed to, then it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's good if it right. works. So anyway, going through some of these things real quick, and then, uh, then you're going to go back and forth. Now, that can be construed as a counteroffer. So if it's a counteroffer, you know, the sellers can either say, hey, look, you know what, we're not going to do anything, or we're going to do some of the stuff, we're going to give you credit. But at that point, the contract can be terminated, yeah. and then everything taken. A couple things I want to get through um, just really quick, because sure. I want to make sure. We have uh, uh, the prorations for things like taxes. Real estate taxes are paid in arrears. The seller always wants it a higher, a hundred or, or lower at 100 percent, and the buyer wants 110. Generally, it's 105 because taxes go up, and so because they're paid in arrears, you don't know what they're going to be. But taxes never go down, Dave. What do they do? They always get more expensive. Yes. So you've been through the attorney review, and you've been through all those kind of things. There's also a mortgage contingency. The mortgage contingency, um, you have to make that that time limit because if you don't have a written mortgage contingency, basically your your lender saying yes, we are going to lend you the money. If you don't have that and you don't ask for an extension of time it, it, within the time, deal. well, then, then you've waived it and you're out of luck. Right. Uh, and, and there's other things that you have consequences. Um, you know, and then other types of things if you're buying a, a condo or, or anything, uh, anything like that. But it's very important. And then you'll go to your closing where everything will be concluded. Money will exchange hands. Actually, it won't. Um, you'll sign all the documents for your loan. It'll get approved by the buyer. Uh, or by your lender, and the seller will sign things uh, taking care of uh, uh, of uh, the, the city stamps and the transfer stamps and everything else uh, that you need, and so you get a clear title uh, for everything that's going on. But it's very important that you get hooked up with a, a realtor that knows what they're doing in the area and an attorney who's experienced with doing real estate. Okay, and everything gets recorded at the county recorder. That's correct. So that you are shown as the record owner. That's right. And then you get a copy of what was recorded. And that's very important because you want to make sure that everything was done properly right. and everything was buttoned up. Right. And your title insurance you'll get. And basically that protects you from any types of incursions, uh, intrusions. For example, if, if you've got a, a, a fence that's over your building line, you know, talk about insuring over that. That's to take care of you. Uh, it's insurance, just like any other insurance, but it's for your title. It's for your property. Yeah. Now, that's a civil matter, correct? It is. Correct. It's a civil trespass issue. Not it, a criminal trespass. It, right, if, if you had something like that. But basically the title insurance is to, hey, to make sure, listen, we're insuring you to say that, look, you're receiving this title as we've written it. It's clear. You've got lock, stock, and barrel. Here you go. Subject, of course, to taxes and easements, utilities, and stuff like that. Okay, so if you're a seller, get your property ready, get a good attorney, get a good realtor, and have a good sale. That's right. Jesse, thanks for joining me once you again. You bet, Dave. We'll see you next time on Legal Action. Take care.